May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The season of Epiphany in which we now find ourselves reveals and proclaims and manifests a democracy of revelation. All people shall experience God's glory. Revelation is built into the very fabric, the reality, and an omnipresent God defined by relational love, not unilateral power, seeks the well-being of all creation and humanity. No exceptions. All are named, recreated, all are welcomed, and all are inspired in their hearts and imaginations to understand in what diverse manner of ways God works, is perceived, hunts us down. The Celtic Church, from which certain of our clergy in this diocese are apostolically descended, speaks of certain places as being thin places, environments where heaven and earth become transparent translucent to one another. Today we celebrate the baptism of Christ in the River Jordan, hidden in a thin place in the desert. And we too, of course, find ourselves in the wilderness of an immensely pluralistic age. Faith is very often sneered at, looked down upon, even the idea that there is a religious or faithful imagination may be sneered at. But it is thought-provoking that the people who compile our lectionary, the lectionary is the book from which all the readings are taken, for every single day. They're remarkable people. I, I mean, it is so complex, the lectionary. The Sunday lectionary works on a three-year basis, as you know, A, B, and C. Ma uh, yes, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John is interspersed throughout those three years. The daily lectionary not the Sunday lectionary, but the daily lectionary is separate and works on a two-year cycle. Not only does it work on a two-year cycle, but the people who compile it have to find the proper readings for morning prayer in this parish, evening prayer, Compline, let alone all the other offices of the church, lords, knowns, sects, sects um, terse, prime, all of the other offices, and I'm sure there are some of you here who know them all off by heart. The people who've compiled the lectionary have, for this specific morning, appointed that first reading that we heard from David from the book Genesis, 
commonly called Genesis uh, in traditional uh, parlance. It is known as the first book of Moses. And that chapter reminds us of the initial fiat, the initial divine creativity, which is both the source of our desire for God and his longing for us, all emerge with the beginning of the cosmos, the universe. In the language of law, L-O-R-E, not L-A-W, in the language of law, imagination, and poetry, Genesis describes the creation of the earth as the interplay of dynamic movement and voice, word, darbar in Hebrew, logos in Greek. A divine breath flows over an unformed chaos. It's interesting, the Hebrew word for breath is identical with the word for spirit. Hold your hands up in front of your mouth and say after me, thank you, thank you, Alison. Hold your hands up in front of your mouth, please, and say after me, ruach. Ruach. Do you feel the breath? It's breath and it's spirit. God breathes ruach into Adam and Eve. He breathes life. He brings beauty and setting in motion the abilities to create again and again. Hence, music, composition, architecture, engineering. Hence, education. Hence, the inspiration. You know, education is not... Oh, I had a terrible shock the other day. Somebody <coughs> studying English literature produced a textbook uh, that, um, you know, high schoolers have to study or undergraduates have to study. And it was a whacking great thick volume like this for English literature uh, from, uh, I don't know, Jane Austen up to the present day, something like that. I was horrified because every single text is actually printed out there. You know, there's Jane Austen, there's Charles Dickens, there are there's Walt Whitman, there's Dylan Thomas, R.S. Thomas, all kinds of people printed out in full. Now, when I was in school, and I'm sure this is true for many of you, we never were given volumes like that. What did we have to do? We had to go, jolly well go, to the library, and we had to get out the Tempest from the shelf, and we had to look up the speech of Prospero at the end of the play, you didn't have this huge, massive textbook that was just so convenient, but of course also lacks something. It lack, lacks a context. It lacks an interplay. It is just one massive volume that you learn by rote. You don't ever learn to look stuff up. But God sets in movement a dynamic, a voice, a word, a darba in Hebrew, a logos in Greek. Out of amniotic water, our lives emerge and from the waters of baptism, we are called out of slavery in the old world, like the children of the Hebrews called to cross through the Red Sea into the promised land. Jack, Joe, shut up. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, 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 just uh, chip. It's okay. Don't worry. Oh. Okay, so right, we've lost another family from the parish. <laughs> just like going through the Red Sea, just like the lustral waters that cured Naaman of his leprosy, St. Mark St. Mark's Gospel describes Christ's baptism and God's dabar, vocation, call to Christ, and that is reflected in every single subsequent baptism. God cares for your life. God cares for the image of the divine in each and every single one of you, Joe and Jack as well. <laughs> God says to us, speaks our name, thou art my beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Baptism is not an occasion for Christian superiority or exclusivism. However, baptism reminds us that God's graces are new every morning. While typically baptism is a once-in-a-lifetime event, we can experience it every single day. That is why there are holy water stoops at each entrance and exit of the church so that you may put on holy water and remind yourselves every time you cross the threshold of this building that you were baptized. During the High Mass, we asperse the congregation. Now that really is a reminder of our baptism. <clears throat> But it doesn't matter whether you're saying morning prayer or noonday prayer or evening prayer or Compline, whether you're in the shower or the bath on a Monday morning, whether you're fixing breakfast, getting ready for work, returning from work, watching... I can't even remember their names now. Um, the one who doesn't like religion. Bill... What? Mayer. Bill Mayer. Is it Mayer or Ma? Ma? Ma. Well, whatever it is. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I love that man. He's a magnificent man. Um, you know, satire is incredibly important, as we've learned this week. Essential to a civilized society. And Bill Ma, Mayer, whatever his name is, uh, I, I really uh, enjoy and look up to. So whether you're watching Bill Maher or you're making breakfast, there is opportunity for renewal and refreshment, for transformation and cleansing, even if it's the most mundane and boring bit of your day. I once knew a priest in a previous parish uh, at which I was attached, and the rector was away one uh, holiday season on vacation. And the church wardens asked the young preach, priest, they asked him, because it was the middle of winter and it was very, very cold, uh, not like Hollywood cold, but very, very cold. They asked him if he'd go down at about 5 a.m. to the basement of the church and switch the boilers on to get some heating, as we've got wonderful heating now in uh, this building. And do you know what he did, what he said to the church wardens? He held up his hands and he said, you see these hands, they were made to consecrate and bless. 
they were not made to switch the boiler on. <clears throat> Needless to say, uh, both the church wardens, the rector, and myself were absolutely horrified when we heard that, and uh, I vowed that day that that would never, uh, I hope and pray, would never be in my heart or my imagination. I try and help out and tidy up chairs and tables and that kind of thing. I've even done some rather unpleasant stuff tidying up outside uh, the church building here. But uh, there's no need to go into that. <laughs> George Herbert, whom you will remember, is one of my great heroes, a Welsh priest and poet. What a good combination, Welsh and priest and poet. He says, or he sings rather, in one of his hymns, and I hope we will have it sometime soon, just a couple of verses from his hymn. This is about seeing God in the ordinary. John Thornbury, are you here? He's around somewhere. There he is. Brushing up the church, clearing up the Christmas decorations, setting out the books for the choir, photocopying the music, um, polishing the pews, repairing them, um, making sure that the audiovisual system is working for the YouTube broadcast, that God can be found in all those things. Herbert says, a man that looks on glass, looking glass, window, mirror, a man that looks on glass, on it may stay his eye. Or, if he pleaseth, through it pass, and then the heaven espy. A servant with this clause makes drudgery divine, who sweeps a room as for thy laws, makes that and the action fine. This is the famous stone that turneth all to gold for that which God doth touch and own cannot for less be told. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.